listen to the vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I'm very privileged to have Ms. Sherry Hersey here, and we are going to have a great conversation. And before we kick that off, I want to know a little bit about you. So tell us, tell us about the great <laughs> Sherry. <laughs> wow, let's see. Um... I've been uh, in the entertainment industry for a very long time. We could say going on four decades. Hard to believe. Um, been a member of Screen Actors Guild and and Equity and AFTRA and all of them doing professional theater, television, movies since I was 18. Wow. And um, I think you probably, some of my bigger claims to fame are Home Improvement, the series with Tim Allen. I played Al's girlfriend, Eileen. Um, in the movie Bring It On, which surprised me with such a huge blockbuster, I play uh, Kirsten Dunst's mom in the movie. I've um, done maybe 12 or more TV movies that I've starred in and other series. I was on Days of Our Lives for a couple of years. Um, my husband and I laugh because Every time we turn on the TV at night, we want to sit down and watch something, he, he'll he peruse through first and put my name in. And just like two nights ago, <laughs> all these things that I was in, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s are now on, you know, they've been digitized and they're airing like Riptide and Tour of Duty. And some of them I'd never even seen because I didn't always watch myself when I was on something. So the other night we watched for the first time me on an episode of Tour of Duty, which was a series, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s. And I played this reporter. They straightened my hair and I had false eyelashes on and I'm playing this 1968 reporter in Vietnam. It's pretty hilarious. So, yeah, I go back. I've had some amazing, amazing experiences as an actress. I was on Mary Tyler Moore, played Marie's daughter. Um, Happy Days. One of my favorites. Happy Days. I played Winnie McKinney, the other Richie Cunningham episode. Um, just a lot of all the MTM shows, Rhoda. I played Chatty, this Chatty Patty girl that worked with Melanie Mayron and Julie Kavner on Rhoda. Loved Valerie Harper to death. She was just the most precious human being. Oh, yeah. um, several <clears throat> movies that I've done that I've been really proud of. And most recently, I um, I would say that in the 90s, at the top of my game, as some people would say, I sort of asked God, what's mine to do? Um, I'm sort of made it, as they would say. I'm, I'm on the number one series on television. I Is this it? Is this all I'm here to do? And I, I really had some life-changing events occur shortly after that. And I ended up, I love children and I love music and I'm probably first and foremost a vocalist. So I've done a lot of singing in movies and voice acting in movies. I've done, believe it or not, over 200 movies of voice, doing voice work. Um, I work with a group called the LA Mad Dogs and we sweeten films and television series. So I got to do things like Shrek. I got to be the <laughs> with the bird with the top voice. Um, <laughs> Madagascar, I like to move it, move it. I've done trolls. I've done all kinds of different singing characters. And then I produced um, a pilot for PBS called Lily's Light. And that turned into a feature film that was released last year. And it is currently airing right now on Amazon Prime, Lily's Light, the movie, where I play the keeper of an enchanted lighthouse and the foster mom to a melting pot of kids. And that became a passion of mine to advocate for fostering and adoption. Mm. Um, I came from a, a family that was very broken and I had a foster sister and she was and still is one of the closest people to me in my life. <laughs> um, and this, this issue we have in our world of especially kids who are considered unadoptable and older and have a really hard time getting finding forever families and end up on the streets is something that I'm passionate about. And um, 
I work with a lot of other nonprofits. I started a nonprofit in that direction called Lily's Fostering Hearts. And so Lily's Light, the movie, advocates for Lily's Fostering Hearts. And I do, and during the course of producing and writing Lily's Light and starring in Lily's Light, the movie, along with my husband, Rick Cowling, who's an amazingly talented musician, and uh, we've written, we wrote a lot of songs for the movie. Um, along with that, we've uh, we developed our own production company, Turning on the Light Entertainment, and we're committed to producing uplifting content and positive music and affirmative um, conscious media, that's what I like to call it, something that gives people a choice of what to put in their head because I am a firm believer that what we hold in our consciousness is what we outpicture in our lives. Oh, that's right. And I know it to be so true. <clears throat> and that alone, that path um, was sort of sparked in some of my darkest hours when I was younger and knew that I could end up in a very self-destructive path if I didn't get help. So mm -hmm. I got help in my teenage years and, um, and also aside from getting you know some great therapists <laughs> to help me i also walked into a unity church unity by the sea which is a um, sort of a progressive um, practical christian path very metaphysical in nature and uh, that really helped me i felt very supported and i've been sort of following unity teaching and studying it and practicing the tools my entire life and it has really helped me awaken to a lot of truth and truth principles that have given me so much in my life that I'm now on a ministry path, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So you're going to be able to do weddings and everything. Yeah. You know, years ago, I actually did that signed up for a friend of mine wanted me to wet, do a, um, a, um, I think it was a christening. And so I did the sign up online to get your certification so that you could do that kind of thing. So I could officially do that anyway. But what being a unity minister for me is more the icing on the cake. I really didn't plan this path to unfold, but because of COVID and being the music and, and audiovisual director at my spiritual center in Thousand Oaks, um, I was producing the weekly content for us and my husband and I were producing three and four music videos a week wow. <laughs> which is a lot of work all around our neighborhood and everywhere I just actually started I thought well you know I don't even have a YouTube channel so I just started Sherry Hersey YouTube channel and I'm sharing yeah I'm sharing some of the music videos and um, some of my acting clips from way back some of them are online so I'm just putting them in a playlist and some of them I'm uploading myself so if anybody wants to like see me in the old days you can check that out see, um, you were on one of my favorite shows of all time the person i wanted to be when i grew up and you didn't mention the six million dollar man oh yeah oh that's hilarious i wanted to be steve austin so bad <laughs> all right steve austin you know <laughs> that was such an important moment for me i did this two-part episode and actually it's on it's on i think NBC Universal, mm -hmm. you can get it right now. And and we, I think we finally either downloaded it or captured it so I could have it because I have this big case downstairs, like an entire trunk of my VHS episodes of everything I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> so as they appear on TV now, and you can see them and they're in much better, you know, they're HD and they've they've transferred them and they look great. We're capturing them so I can keep them. but. That was a funny one. I was very young, two part episode, and we did it in uh, Cape Canaveral. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I was captured, tied up. Steve Austin had to rescue me. And what I thought was really funny, it was one of my earlier acting gigs. And the thing that really was <laughs> so funny for me is that he would go home because he was there every day. So they would let him do his close-ups first and then go home so they didn't burn him out, you know, because he was having to work every single day. Right, so by right. the time it came to my, here, here I am, 18 years old, There, it's time for my close-up, and I'm expecting to do it with, with you know, Lee Majors. And he's he goes home, and they're like, 
okay, we're ready for your close-up now. And I'm, I'm like, well, where, where's the actor? Where's Lee Majors? And they're like, oh, we sent him home. And I'm like, well, who am I supposed to be doing this with? Oh, no. <laughs> it was my first real-life experience of, you're making this all up right now. And you're going to be looking over here, looking over here, and the director's going to point, and you're going to react, and there's nothing going on. It's you creating it. I was at first kind of disillusioned. I thought I'm going back to theater. This is no, this is not fun. <laughs> Man, that I would have been heartbroken. <laughs> I was heartbroken. I really was. But he was really sweet to me, and and um, I I have had an amazing career, and it ain't over yet. So, and knowing that my movie's out right now, and that. It's gotten almost five stars, like four and a half stars on Amazon, and it's on Pure Flix for anybody who has that subscription. Um, and the Dove Foundation gave us really great reviews and really high marks too, and that meant a lot to me. So, yeah, I'm I'm super happy about what we're doing. That's, you know, to advocate for something that a lot of people really don't think about day to day. You know, you, you have to make folks aware go out there and find some kid that needs some love and attention like that and give it to him. Absolutely. And it's never too late. And it mm. doesn't because there are a lot of stories, really beautiful success stories of older single people and older couples um, fostering a child in their late teens just to give them the opportunity to have family when they go off to college, to have someone to come home to to make that transition some people have even waited there was a beautiful story I just I just read um, about a social worker who had been an advocate for a child since she was 11 years old but because she was this child's appointed um, advocate she could not legally adopt her it was a conflict of interest mm -hmm. so they they formed a bond and they, the, the young girl ended up calling her mom just out of respect. And when she turned 19, when she aged out of the system, she was adopted by this woman. Oh. And there are so many stories um, of people who are older, who've adopted older kids. And that's what I'm, where my heart is right now. My, I have bonus children as well. Oh. And, um, you know, I'm up for foster care too, if you need. <laughs> well, I will tell you, I've actually got a house full of adults. Like, friends laugh at me right now because I foster older adult, you know, older kids. I, have a, I have a friend that comes and camps out in my house in his RV and lives here half the time. Right now, I have another gentleman who's staying. He's in, he's from my spiritual community and his, he's making a transition from retiring to moving to a new home that he bought in St. George, Utah. So he's staying, you know, with me and my husband temporarily. And that's what they say. You adopt older people. <laughs> but I, my youngest daughter just moved out um, a couple of months ago. And I just said to Rick, I said, it's time now. We, we bought this house up here, this beautiful place to have our own studio downstairs, to be close to our spiritual center to have, you know, it be a sanctuary. We have World Day of Prayer here. We've had concerts on our balcony and we have room. And I said, it's time. It's time for us to foster to adopt a teenager or two and give them that because that's really where the need is. All the very young children usually get adopted pretty quickly um, when people, young couples are looking for children and they want younger kids usually. But it's the middle, you know, the 10 to, 19 age that doesn't usually find forever homes and can be moved around and it's a it's a real it's a real challenge for us yeah some of us kids in our 50s can't find a home either <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to my home i really like you kyle you have a lot in common <laughs> Well, you know, you, that's something I didn't mention is, you know, the, a lot of the younger kids, they are able to find homes. It's the older kids that can't find a place and yes. uh, they need love, too. That's yeah. what the story in Lily's Light is about. It's about a 14 year old boy who loses his only living relative and he wants to run away with his pig, his pot belly pig and he's <laughs> at the lighthouse and we take him on an adventure. The lighthouse has the ability to illuminate our imagination. And so the story seed can be developed 
in the adventure section where we go up to the top of the lighthouse and say, I am the light that shines on me, illuminate the world I see. And then we go into a make-believe imaginary adventure that sort of gives them the, the tool they need to help them in life. You know, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but I can't help but have to mention that this seems the world is kind of geared to uh, making people more self-centered and not caring for other people. And when, when you have so many folks out there that just want, they just need some kind of hope, some kind of love. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not tooting my horn here. It was, this is all um, my wife, but we had went to go to uh, a natural Springs just to spend the day. And we stopped to get some ice and stuff. And my wife is in there and there's a, a, she couldn't help but overhear this guy. He's asking for a job and the, the people that owned the little store were trying to get him hooked up with the job. He's, he's homeless. He was just looking for, he, he's not asking for you to, to give him a handout. He was actually looking for a job. And the lady said, you know what? Let me fix you something to eat. And he's like, oh, I, I can't. I don't have any money. She said, oh, don't worry about it. It's on me. And my, my wife said she could actually hear a voice telling her while she was at the ATM, Gra grab an extra 20 bucks out. And she went and she just handed it to him. And with a tear in his eye, he's like, why me? And she said, I don't know. It's just I was told to give this to you. So I'm giving it to you. And. Yeah, that, that could have meant the, meant the difference of, you know, whether this guy had enough hope to go on or he would have ended it all just because a few people got together and said, hey, let's let's do something for you. I'm with you. Ah, makes me want to cry. There's so many times that I've had someone that I didn't even know. And most recently, it just happened to me at a memorial service. And I'm telling you, it was just really touching. Um, that a handful of people there shared with me how I had touched this person's life when we were younger because uh, and and I was so I felt so good about myself when we do things for others just because we want to for nothing in return just completely unconditionally just giving love wherever we can in any way that we can without judgment without anything because we don't know what anyone's path is like we can't judge anyone else we don't know why that person was homeless we don't and people because it's too painful to even feel it most of the time they qualify that experience by making a judgment about it or saying well he's probably no good he doesn't work he doesn't do this he doesn't do that you know it's like people raging on the freeway they've come up with some scenario as to why that person's going so slow and why they're such an idiot and the truth of the matter is we have no clue what that person <laughs> might be going through and if we could just train ourselves to think the best of each other and unfortunately in our society we don't we are trained. i'm guilty of it we all are i mean from childhood i remember one of the biggest things i thought about this you know, it was kind of a polite thing to have a pity party together with other people. I mean, my, my grandmother would host her friends or they'd come over and they'd talk about life and how difficult it was. And she felt it was necessary to say, well, let me tell you about how bad it is for me. And they'd go on and on and on trying to out, you know, they dramatize their situation in such a pitiful way and be more victims about life. And that's mm -hmm. what we were kind of trained to do. We're not actually trained well at a young age to see the good in every situation or in every person. We just aren't. And that is, if we do that even the little bit, we start training ourselves and our minds to shift those thoughts, those negative thoughts and those judgments and those things, our life changes. Oh, yeah. And, and, the, and the positive things show up and the situations show up. And it's been one of my life lessons for whatever reason that I have been somehow trained by life that things are not as they appear. I thought about my father and very negative things about my dad growing up who basically um, deserted me in my mind as a child. And um, I, 
I held that pain in my body my whole life until I developed breast cancer in 2015. Mm. Through that journey to healing, I had to let go of these judgments and these preconceived ideas that I was holding on to in my body that made me feel dispensable. And I found somebody brilliant, a therapist, absolutely brilliant, very like-minded with me. And she pointed it out to me and helped me recognize my own power in the situation in my life. And that my dad did the best he could with what he knew how to do. And even though I had already felt like, well, I for, you know, the forgiveness had already occurred and it already happened, I was still holding on to a lot of that victim mentality in my body. Yep. I know what you mean. Yep. And once I let that go, I felt like, whoa, the heaviness of that, that I was carrying. And I ended up having a, a, a pretty miraculous recovery. And I know without a doubt it had to do with my releasing a lot of that programming that I was holding on to. And one thing that I teach is that gratitude changes your attitude. You're, with, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And in every situation, no matter what it looks like, you know, if we can just be grateful for that moment of life, that moment of breath, that moment of that person is helping us or, th or this is going on or the sky or the sun is out. Or I did it this morning when I sat in my swing and looked out at my property and I went, I love this place. I love where I live. I'm so grateful for this moment. And then I'm here to enjoy it. And then I'm surrounded by so much love in my life and an opportunity to create and to give back because that's where I am now. For me, every choice I get to make, which is another blessing, is what do I want to give back to the world? What do I want to share with the world? You know? what, what do you want to be remembered for after you pass away? Right. You know, do you think that when you get to heaven... God's going to say, Hey, where's that Oscar that you won? <laughs> or, you know, and he's going to say, uh, when I put on your heart to help that, you know, that poor person on the side of the road, you know, that's, that's what he's going to look at. That's what God's going to look at. I one time did, um, I did, a, I produced a little series here in Thousand Oaks and also in Florida called contagious optimism live with a man who wrote the book, Contagious Optimism, David Mezapel. And it was all about very positive, motivational people speaking and posy artists singing affirmative songs. And we talked to a lot of older people, one of the books that David had written, and David and I went and, and talked to a lot of seniors about what's the most important thing in their lives. What do they look back on? What do they remember? And hands down, there wasn't one person who talked about what they had accomplished in life. They talked about who they loved and who loved them. And that was it across the board. And even my grandfather, who Grandfather Hersey, who lived to be 98 years old, I remember him saying to me, you know, his wife had died 30 years younger. And he had said to me, if I'd only known, I'd have spent more time with my sweetheart. And uh, that was all that he could think about. It didn't matter that he had a very successful pharmacy and a, another business over here and anything like that. It wasn't, and we get so caught up in thinking that these things outside are gonna make us happy. Fortunately for me, I had the gift of getting to what I thought was the top, so to speak, and saying, okay, this is it. You know, this isn't gonna bring me everything. And, uh, and it, does, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how successful you get. That's not where happiness is. Well, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I have a, a selfish reason for becoming successful is that I want to buy a large enough acreage that I could build enough homes for all my kids to live on. So I have my family with me all the time and they're not spread out all over the place. So that's, that's what I want. <laughs> I don't have anything against success. And I think if you've got a vision and you're motivated, you can do it all and we can have it all. I believe that. I really do. 
but it's all about why and what you're doing it for. It's and that's you're right. You know, if it's um, because I would do the same thing. I'm really if I could put a, a blanket of love and nurturing around every child that needs a home or a mom, I would do it. You know? Yeah, that's what I'd love to do. Okay, don't make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, oh, so we we had been talking before we got started. Uh, you sang with Ambrosia. Oh, well, my husband. Yeah, that was just for fun. Um, I did one gig with them. Um, that's not my claim to fame, but I love them all. They're so great. Uh, Joe Puerta, who is and Burley Drummond. Um, original two of the original ambrosia members my husband rick cowling uh took over for david pack and sang uh lead for them for years he's actually the one that did the jimmy fallon show with ambrosia he's the one singing lead he's a phenomenal singer and musician and he he has his own band here in los angeles and we sing together every sunday by the way oh, <laughs> and we write cool. music together but um he still goes out with ambrosia once in a while mostly he works with kenny loggins now and uh, he either plays guitar, bass, or keys for Kenny. And this is probably Kenny's last year. So it's been a lot of fun. Kenny's invited me to go along on a lot of the gigs so that I don't have to be apart from Rick. And um, he's been very generous to us. He actually, uh, we used Heartlight which I had always wanted to use in Lily's Light. We used Kenny Loggins' song, Heartlight. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Like a beacon in the night, welcome to Heartlight. Yeah, yeah we used yeah. that as the outro song in Lily's Light, the movie. And Kenny gave us a lot of tips. Rick and I sang our own version of it, and then Kenny sang backup for us. Oh, cool. <laughs> and he's he shows up as a cameo at the end of the movie. He videotaped himself so he could be in it. Um, he's, he's on my list of people that I want to meet before I pass away. So, oh, well, okay. So I'll have to let you know if they do anything close to where you are and you'll have to come. If they come to Austin, I want to go see. Yes. Yes. I wish I'd known you then when we were there last, because <laughs> we were there not too long ago. But anyway. Well, Kenny Loggins, just one of those guys that uh, there's something upbeat about his music that I love to sing along to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh what the song with stevie nicks um oh was, whenever i call you friend yeah whenever i call you friend that's one of my i have to listen to that when i go on a long trip yeah <laughs> and rick does a lot of rick sings a lot with him and sings a lot of those parts like he'll sing some of stevie's parts with kenny or he'll sing michael mcdonald's parts with kenny um so kenny really uses rick a lot rick knows so many musicians and it's kind of a small world you know, the, the musician world, um, the people that play with each other and bounce around and sub for each other. And, you know, it's kind yeah. of like the acting world in a lot of ways. We, all the people that you've competed with and you've gone out for jobs with and worked with, and I love it. Sometimes I'll watch a show and I'll go, oh my gosh, that's where I met that person. Oh, I didn't realize that, you know, we go that far back or, you know, what was your first concert? Ooh, my first concert was uh, Tom Petty and Bob Dylan. Oh, wow. I was 13 years old. Wow. Mine was Three Dog Night. Oh, I, that's a band I wished I had been able to see. And then, you know, when I think about it, oh, I was so young, and I, my mom made me this really cool outfit to wear. I thought I was so cool. And then years later, um, because I sang, and I've always been a singer, even though I made my living as an actress, I would go to New York in the summertime and do a show so that I could still continue to sing and be a part of musical theater because I loved it so much. And I got to, to work with Randy Newman um, and do a, a show based on his life, play his, his mother and his sweetheart in this production that we did with him. And gosh, I worked with Smokey Robinson. I've gotten to work, I've been able to work with a lot of amazing artists and um steve dorf i don't know if you know steve dorf he's a songwriter steve dorf and john bettis they wrote oh my god they've written so many songs through the years they've written a lot of george Strait tunes and they've written um ann murray songs and kenny rogers and uh tons of and um 
So Steve Dorff wrote a musical that I was in, and John Bettis did the lyrics for that. So I've sort of had my hand in music my whole career. I've got to introduce you to Cy Young. I don't know if you know who Cy Young is, but he actually yes. he actually wrote and produced stuff on uh, Broadway as well as performed on Broadway. Um, if you recall that song, Draw Me a Circle, that Barbara Streisand sang, uh, Cy wrote that song. Wow. And that's, you know, that made, that's what made, you probably thought of Steve Dorff because I know he did a lot of arrangements for Barbara. Wow. Yes, you do need to introduce me to Cy Young. Cy is friends with the guy that wrote Chicago. Oh, nice. So he's been around for a while. <laughs> well, we probably know a lot of the same people. <laughs> oh my God, you you love Cy. He's just he's kind of like that. Uh, I don't want to say grandpa, more like a, that fun uncle. <laughs> yes. Yes. Actually, you can probably say grandpa. He probably wouldn't mind. You could even say grandma to me because I'm gonna be a grandma. At oh, the end of the month. congratulations! Thank you. I'm gonna have a grandson. Ah, they're, they're fun. I'm so excited. <laughs> they're a mess, but they're fun. They're fun. I have, I have three grandsons. Oh man, <laughs> it's it's exciting. I just had we just had a shower, but my daughter's in Kentucky, so I'm like ah, too far away for me. But that's all right. Aww. I'll be I'll be traveling a lot. They're they're fun, and you get to send them back to mom and daddy when you're exactly. tired of them. Exactly. <laughs> they're going to be fun to spoil and to be able to say, oh, now it's your problem. <laughs> you handle it. <laughs> yeah, my my daughter gets upset because when I go to the store, I have to come back with something from, for the youngest one. You know, he loves little Hot Wheels cars, so it's Aww. like, well, he doesn't have that one yet. He doesn't Aww. need it. No, yes, he does. <laughs> well, I have family in Pilot Point, Texas, too. My, oh, okay. my sister in Pilot Point and her three kids, also. So I'm there once in a while. I don't know how far that is from you guys, but. Texas is a big place. I, I have to look it up because, you know, every time there's a storm that comes through Texas, you hear of some little town you've never heard of before. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> I also had something really interesting happen. Wow. Um, two years ago, during the middle of COVID, I did my DNA test, you know, 23andMe. Mm -hmm. And discovered that I had a sister I didn't know about. Really? So Yes. So I have since met her. She looks just, we look so much alike. It's ridiculous. And um, it's been amazing. So I went to visit her. She lives in South Carolina, where I was originally from. And we've like long lost, you know, sisters that were both estranged from our father and the rest of our family. So we have a lot in common. Well, that's got to be exciting, you know, to have family. I I, I hate the fact that a lot of families as the, you know, the, the patriarchy and the matriarchy of the family pass away. It's people go their separate ways. You never hear from them anymore. I know. I'm all about family. And then to find one you didn't know you had. I know. I know. And it's really special. And, and we, the way we discovered it was really special was her daughter that was on 23 and me. And she kept coming up as my, as like my first cousin but with more DNA than a first cousin. And I was like, well, I asked all my family members, who is this cousin? And nobody knew who it was. And then she came up as my great niece. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I don't have anybody. And then I thought, my half sister who lives in Texas, her son did it and he came up as my great nephew. So then I went, oh, I have another sibling somewhere. And we called, we reached out, and um, my biological sister and I reached out to the daughter because the same thing happened. She got her, she had her come up as a great niece. We reached out and we talked and talked and tried to figure out how we could be related. And finally, the girl said, um, she said, you know what? I think that my mom is your sister because she looks just like Sherry. Wow. And we ended up finding out that was true. So, so. Any plans to move back out that way? 
You know, we just moved um, right before COVID. We bought the house we live in currently in Moore Park in the Hills. And we, we looked around the periphery of Los Angeles because we were just sort of tired of being right in the middle of the city. Yeah. And I wasn't having to run around on interviews as much as I used to. And I'd started producing on my own. And I was using my little house in the San Fernando Valley as our production office. And people were coming in and out all the time. And even though it was centrally located, it just didn't give us any privacy. So uh, we started looking for a big enough place to house our production company. And we bought a rather big property and a big house. Uh, It was gutted. And so we built it from 2018 to 2019. We built it so we could live in it. Sold my other home, moved here. And we've been, and then during COVID, we were in full production most of the time because the industry shut down. Um, Rick wasn't touring. No, he wasn't working. I wasn't really working much. So we started producing videos and making music videos for all kinds of spiritual centers all over. We were supplying music videos for Unity Center New York and Chattanooga and all over the place. So, what do you prefer, uh, in front of the camera or behind the camera? That's tough. Um, I like both, but I what I liked the most in front of the camera was being on a series or being on a movie that I was there every day, because coming from theater background, it's the it's the teamwork and the community of working together. I never really liked so much the acting the aspect of acting where i got a guest star part and i have to show up and just do my thing and then leave and i don't get to know everybody but it was really important for me to um be able to um be a part of the crew all the time and if i'm there from the morning until you know the, the end of the day and i'm part of the crew and i know everybody then it feels like theater to me you know it feels like family So that's what I like the most. And being a producer, you have that same feeling. And I didn't realize until Lily's Light that I was a writer at heart. And um, so that's that's been kind of exciting. I also, when I found out about my diagnosis in 2015, we were actually on a video shoot that day. And Spirit said to me, you're going to shoot this. So we ended up videotaping every aspect of my journey, my breast cancer journey. And I have created, I didn't edit it because I didn't really want to look at the footage, to be honest. I Uh, I didn't want to take myself back to that time so much. But I really wanted it to be helpful to anyone who might be afraid of what that looked like and what they might have to go through. So at some point we're going to release it as a sort of uplifting documentary. And um, it's close to being finished. It's going to be music driven because um, from the moment I I found out about it, I started sitting down at the piano and singing affirmative songs and uh, claiming my victory. And it's really full of a lot of um, spiritual tools and what I did and how I... Um, how I surrendered to the process and accepted it and mastered it, basically. Do you think that gave you a little bit more strength doing that? I don't know, necessarily. I think it... um, You think it was more faith-based? It was totally faith-based, but I think I, I approached it... I have a philosophy that I've... I heard from um, a Reverend Denise Schellink that I love, which is what's before me is for me. I believe in all things work for the good. Mm -hmm. And um, in our philosophy, unity, God is good. And good is everywhere and good in everything. It's just really having the eyes to see it. And if we live, even as the Bible taught us, in joy, that is a statement of faith knowing that all is perfect in our world, no matter what it looks like. Um, That's where the temptation comes to give power to something other than God. And that's really what happened for me is that I just said, I'm going to embrace this walk. I'm going to embrace, you know, this is, I'm going to, you know, going to walk my talk. I'm going to be in the moment. I'm going to be present. I'm going to give my life to God and I'm going to, experience all the joy I can through this journey 
and it was amazing some of the miracle things that happened some of the people's lives um, there was one moment in particular that was really special to me I was in radiation and I saw this woman in radiation every day who looked very sad and depressed and I'm kind of a I can be kind of a clown and when people are a little down I tend to want to lift their spirits but she didn't seem to want to have anything to do with anyone and she always had her head down and she was sort of sitting in the corner and she looked like she was struggling in life in general and um, I started praying over her just closing my eyes and saying some prayers just affirming the truth of who she is and that I could see her as whole and healthy and and um, I don't know what I was doing with my hands but probably something like this and she looked up and said what are you doing and I said I'm seeing your angels around you and I'm talking to them and she kind of got a puzzled look on her face and I thought oops I've kinda, I hope I haven't offended her in any way so I said goodbye and I walked out and the next day when we went back to radiation I hear this woman come barreling through the doors and she's like where is Sherry where is Sherry and she comes running in and she has ah, she had a rose in one hand and a little bag with some uh, bath wash that she got from somewhere and she was probably from you know East Los Angeles and didn't have anything here she had brought me a gift and she hugged me like you know with such gratitude and she said you changed my life yesterday you changed my life and she was just weeping we both started weeping and she said I thought I was gonna die now I know I'm gonna be okay wow. and it was just and my husband of course has the camera right there because he's like his little he was just using his iPhone or whatever camera he had and he interviewed her afterwards too so there were just you know once lots of wonderful moments like that of just being present to what's going on and loving yeah. each other through the process yeah. and yeah. what that did for me was amazing what that did for me to know that that's really that's who I am that's what I want I want to be that in every way that I can yeah. um, and when we can get out of you know the fear and the worry and the stress and I mean it's tough it's not I'm not denying I mean there were moments more likely more a couple of years after it almost felt like I was carried on wings during the difficult part but then afterwards the post-traumatic stress set in and then I'd wake up in the middle of the night with like fear consuming me and sweats and like I'd have to battle I'd have to claim I'd have to say I am a divine child of God I did not inherit disease I am healed whole and healthy and I would have to keep claiming my birthright yeah. and um, and fight that you know that to me is the battle of heaven and earth you know that is the battle the good and bad <laughs> God has been so good to me through the years and some people look at the things that I've been through and they think that I've had such an awful life and yeah some of the things were terrible but I know people that have gone through the same or worse than I have a lot worse than what I have, but he's, he puts that on me because he knows how much I can handle and that I can pass it on or as they say, pay it forward. I've had certain people come into my life that um, their presence has made uh, such a difference, brought me strength. Um, I, I got shot when I was in my young 20s and I was in rehab to get my arm to work again and while I'm there there's an older gentleman that sat in the table next to me and we just both kind of made those faces every time the the therapist would you know make us do these exercises and whatnot and anyway we just we recognized each other whenever we came in and I stopped and I talked to him one day while we were waiting to go in for our appointments. And his wife was there this time. And she had on this satin jacket and it said Swayze dancing on the back of it. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. My, my wife would love that because she's a big Patrick Swayze nut, right? Come to find out that was Patrick Swayze's aunt. Ah, wow. Kitty. And Kitty 
took us in as if we were one of her kids and it helped me through those times to to get that strength back and you know our husband was a drummer so he had to kind of learn to drum again he had been in a car accident and messed up his arm and um it, it's just we go through things and we think why us why why instead of saying okay what what did you need me to go through this for you know what what did you need me to do next and so that's uh i'm sorry i get choked up sometimes yeah. thinking about them because they were so sweet and uh i'm gonna miss them really am they were a big part of my life and now uh, they're not here but they're, they're still here i know they are absolutely <laughs> um, <sighs> moving on this is not about me <laughs> you know, and none of us get none of us you know get through life without it lifing on us you know what i mean life life's on us as one of my friends reverend sherry says not me reverend sherry but another reverend sherry and it's true um it's how we handle it it's how we um what perspective we give it and it makes all the difference and i feel like there are those moments where we have these tests in life and if we can just let go of qualifying as anything scary or fearful or putting too much energy on it then it just kind of dissipates it goes away and it feels like that's what hap that's happened to me so many times in my life where i look like i'm coming up against a big rock but if i just say okay let's see how we're going around this one and and i really don't put a lot of resistance energy up. I just stay in the flow as much as I possibly can and try to train my mind not to go off into, you know, ego land and freak out and, you know, why me and all of those things that are, yeah. if I do that, then that, that boulder just seems to get smaller and smaller and it seems to just disappear. And it's the more resistance energy I put up, the bigger it gets. We're really powerful. We really, really, really are powerful. I mean, God created us in this amazing way. And we can call on all of those aspects of God, divine nature that is within us, which is indwelling, the indwelling God that we have. And we can call on all of those aspects and live our life in such an amazing way. But... Gosh, how, how often did we say, why me, why me, why me? I know. And that's old. That's like, you know, that's, that's where we're evolving from that kind of consciousness. That's, that's victim consciousness. And we're, we're evolving from that. I really think we are. I, I look at life like, here's our earthly reality. You know, it's like polar. It's like negative, positive, whatever it is. You know, people battle this this is right. This is wrong. This is right. It's always this kind of thing, back and forth. People take polar opposite sides of everything. But if we go to spiritual reality, it's here in the middle and it only goes up. And that is the reality we need to strive to live in. At least I do. That's where, that's where God exists, living there. You know, this other playground is just for us to witness and observe and to learn from so we can get closer to source, to spirit. Yeah, we have to to get to that that next level of enlightenment to to get closer to the spirit of god and i still believe that there is a god is this consciousness and yes. it's all central and that's where we're all striving to get to and yes. you know i used to not look at it that way but the people that i have met have really helped me to to trust in this um, i know that i've gone through what i've gone through um, not for anybody to feel sorry for me, but to, um, to, to pick up knowledge along the way that I could help someone else. And so if I had, let's say that I kept a healthy body and I was still working, well, I wouldn't be doing this right now. And I wouldn't have met you. I wouldn't have met the people that I've met on the journey. And then the, the person out there that needed to hear this message, they wouldn't have gotten to hear it. Right. So so what okay so my spine's jacked up I, i'm still alive <laughs> i'm doing i'm doing what i like doing and, and and helping others and that's that's the only reason i really talk about the things that happens to me is because i know somebody out there is going through something 
very similar and they need to hear a positive message and the people that I bring on it's that they've not only helped me with my knowledge and, and to be able to move on, but they've, they're helping lots of people out there, people that really need to hear it. And I thank you. Well, I, I'm grateful for you and I appreciate what you're doing. I really do. Well, yeah. thank this you. was a big surprise for me, basically, because I didn't realize we'd have so much of a deep connection and I'm really grateful. Thank of course, you. it doesn't surprise me. That's how spirit works. But it's always, a, it's always so, you know, just always so exciting when you find that out, when you go, oh, of course. Now I know why I'm on his show. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah. if you run across someone who has a story to tell, uh, and by no means do they have to be famous or anything like that, just if they have a story they would want to tell, please send them my way because that's what the platform is for and they can help someone else and you're going to run across some people on your journey that um they, they could be a great influence for others i will and i will think of you believe me we're going to stay in touch anyway i i hope so because i definitely want you to meet Sai, and i i think you need to meet my wife too I, you're you'll be surprised at her abilities yeah, you need to meet Rick. He just walked in a second ago. He must have just gotten home and he saw I was busy, so he went back out. But, yeah, you have to meet Rick. I definitely want to do that. <laughs> uh, I'd like to talk to him about his music if he'd love to, to get on sometime. Absolutely. Yeah, he's he's a hoot. He's also <laughs> very, very talented. We'll have to sing you a song. I'll oh, that would be cool. I'll send you some links so you can see us work. <laughs> nice. I love music. Well... Thank you again, Sherry. I really appreciate your time. And, and uh, it means a lot when people can give a part of their day to, to me and my audience. I'm so grateful. I appreciated it. Thank so. you. Well, to all you out there, if you are new to the channel, thank you for stopping by. I hope you'll subscribe and please come back. So we meet great people like Sherry and, and they, they always have something special to share. And for those of you who are regular to the channel, thank you so much for your support. It's because of you that we do what we do. And so until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube, follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network. 